Hey, welcome back to this moment of grace and let me just give you a hug. Oh, oh, I needed to give you a virtual hug. I missed you. Like Chris Farley in that meme that I shared coming in on the Dave Letterman show, I'm about ready to tweak out in this quarantine. I miss you. I love you all. Thank you for being with me here on this moment of grace. Thoughts from his heart to impart grace for your moment. So I'm so grateful that you're here today with me. It's a privilege. Thank you so much. Hey, before you go anywhere, would you please subscribe to this channel, like the video, comment down below to let me know how this moment speaks to your heart there in quarantine land. And I'm praying for you and trusting the Lord is keeping you and healing you and blessing you with his peace. There has been a viral post that's been going around talking about how God has initiated all this stuff with coronavirus. And he's saying, since you didn't want to worship me, I'll take away all your stuff. And that'll really show you. And I want to talk today about the judgments of God. Is God judging us with the coronavirus? Let's talk about it today. It's going to be a great topic. So please stay tuned. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. You're going to love it. Two fundamental truths that anchor us to our faith in Christ. I believe are number one, that God is immutable, unchangeable. God never changes. And number two, that that God is perfectly revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Would you agree? If you're a Christian, if you believe in Jesus, I would say that that is orthodox to believe and accept such a thing. We always want to stay anchored in Jesus as the source and the vision of our faith. Jesus shows us exactly what God is like and who God is has always been. Here in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, I want to read a few thoughts about the judgment of God. For God has proved his love by giving us his greatest treasure, the gift of his son. And since God freely offered him up as the sacrifice for us all, he certainly won't withhold from us anything else he has to give. If you feel like God's holding something back from you, know that God is a benevolent hider and he hides things for you, not from you. Jesus said, if you being evil give good gifts to your children, how many of you fathers would give your child a stone if he asked for bread? Would you give him a serpent if he asked for fish? No. How much more my father in heaven will give to you the Holy Spirit to those who ask? God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. Verse 33, who then would dare to accuse those whom God has chosen in love to be his? Well, leave it to Christians to be accusers of the brethren, as we often are. But we know who the real accuser is, don't we? The book of Revelation calls the serpent, the devil of old, the accuser of the brethren. Accusation is the nature of the devil. Think about that for a minute. Wow. God himself is the judge. All right. So we've got God as the judge and he is issuing judgments. Let's see what that judgment is. God himself is the judge who has issued his final verdict over you and I, and that is not guilty. The cross is the declaration that God has judged us all worthy of his love. He judged us worthy of dying for. He said, I would rather die than be God without you. Not having you was never an option for your heavenly father. And he died to prove that as his eternal reality. Verse 34, who then is left to condemn us? Again, in steps religious folks, <laughs> but not just religious folks. They're my people too. I've been a religious person most of my life. There's plenty of condemnation to be found in the world, but often we find ourselves empowered in a false sense of self-righteous pride that we feel empowered to judge other people because we feel that we've done a good enough job on our own. But the law always proves our bankruptcy to live for God apart from God. The point of the law was always to bring us to the reality that we need a savior. Every single one of us. And the good news is, as John chapter 3 verse 16 declares, that Jesus is the savior of the whole world. Hallelujah. Verse 34, who then is left to condemn us? Certainly not Jesus, the anointed one, for he gave his life for us. And even more than that, 
He has conquered death and has now risen, exalted and enthroned by God at his right hand. So how could he possibly condemn us since he is continually praying for our triumph? And let me tell you, my friends, Jesus always gets his prayers answered. That means that you are destined for triumph. God Almighty is praying for your triumph. So why would he condemn you? Verse 35, Paul continues on with God's judgment against us. Who could ever separate us from the endless love of God's anointed one? Absolutely no one. For nothing in the universe has the power to diminish his love towards us. So God's judgment is always aimed at restoring you, at redeeming you. And his judgment is never aimed at destroying you. It's always aimed at destroying what was prohibiting your freedom. Now, if we move over to the gospel of John chapter 16, Jesus says to his disciples, it's to your advantage that I go away here in verse six. For if I don't go away, the divine encourager will not be released to you. But after I depart, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will expose sin and prove that the world is wrong about God's righteousness and his judgments. You know, insurance companies call natural disasters acts of God. And where do we think that they got their language from? They got their language from the church. He said the Holy Spirit's coming here in verse 8 to prove the world is wrong about God's judgments. Verse 9, he says, sin because they refuse to believe in who I am. Jesus just highlights what sin is right there. Sin is not something you're, that you're doing necessarily. Sin is a state of being. Or shall we say sin is a, sin is a distortion of the truth of our being. He says, Holy Spirit will expose sin because they refuse to believe in who I am. So the real sin is refusing to see the truth about who Jesus is. <laughs> What's the antidote to sin? It's believing the truth about the nature and character of God. God is love. And therefore, we being made in the image of God are love as well. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Who could ever earn this? Nobody. It's the gift of God. God's righteousness, because I'm going back to join the Father and you'll see me no longer. So he's saying that Jesus himself is the righteousness of God personified. And he's going back to be with the Father. So righteousness is not something we do. Righteousness is who Jesus is. Woo! Verse 11, and judgment because the ruler of this dark world has already received his judgment and his sentence. You see, the judgment of God is aimed at the devil. The judgment of God is aimed at the accuser of the brethren. Now we see Jesus speaking very harshly to the Pharisees who have sided with the accuser of the brethren and have become the voice of the enemy against Jesus, the anointed one. And Jesus is seen contradicting the truth of their being because they've sided with the murderer, the one who is the father of lies, the accuser. But God's judgment was aimed at the ruler of this dark world. And it says he's already received his sentence. I want to just liberate you today from the fear that God's going to judge you if you're not living up to code, if you're not having enough faith that he's going to judge you with some sort of virus or death or punishment. First John chapter four tells us about the character and the nature of God. He says that there is no fear in love for perfect love casts out fear. Love judges fear. Love casts out fear. Love has placed the divine sentence on fear and has judged it and cast it out. It says because fear has to do with the tormenting thought of punishment. Anyone who still fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Love is the ultimate judgment of God. The cross is proof. <laughs> 
that God has judged you worthy of love. Jesus made it plain in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, when he said, The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. But I come that they would have life and life abundantly. The judgment of God on you is life in abundance. He has come to judge the ruler of this dark world, which he has done perfectly at the cross of Calvary. The thief is the author of killing and stealing and destroying. That is simply not the nature of God. I will declare to you confidently today, my friends, that although God works incredible good out of tragedy and loss, God is never the orchestrator of those tragedies. God has always been like Jesus, and Jesus has always rebuked storms, healed the sick, raised the dead, and set the captives free. And he can still show up four days late to your funeral on time, because that is what God is like, because that is what love does. Who will condemn you? Who's going to judge you? Certainly not Jesus, the anointed one. And Jesus shows us exactly what God is like. When we look at Jesus hanging on the cross, he's showing us what the judgment of Abba Father looks like. It looks like an unconditional love that knows no limits to show you how you are worthy of his love. And there's nothing that could ever stop him from redeeming you with his love. Well, guys, I love you. It's so great to have you here with me today. Would you please remember to subscribe, like the video, comment below to let me know what you think of this moment. And check out the description below for great resources and grace. And I just pray you guys are doing well, staying connected and, and uh, just bathing in his love for you in, in the midst of this chaos and turmoil in the pandemic that we are in right now. But the Lord is going to show off big time. I declare that in your life today in Jesus' name. Don't go anywhere because there's another great moment coming up for you right now in Jesus' mighty name. Love you guys. See you soon.